Nan Geschke, your host of the Los Altos History Show this evening. Our guest Yvonne Jacobson and I have been looking through an album of old photographs that speak of the era of farming here in Los Altos and Los Altos Hills. This time of year um, sometimes makes people nostalgic for the time when our valley uh, was planted with fruit trees and when in early springtime there were a sea of blossoms everywhere. That time interested our guest Yvonne so much that what began as a family project evolved into a book called Passing Farms, Enduring Values. This book is a very interesting one. It's filled with wonderful photographs and I highly recommend it to you. Yvonne Jacobson was born and raised in the heart of Santa Clara Valley. She attended local schools including Stanford University where she majored in English and after obtaining a master's degree in English from Columbia University, Yvonne traveled to South Africa where she married a fellow Stanford student. The two returned to Santa Clara Valley in 1963 and have resided here ever since. Yvonne has been a lecturer at San Jose State University and De Anza College and she's also a trustee for the California History Center located at De Anza. Um, Yvonne was born into a farming family, the Olsons, whose cherry orchard is a familiar landmark, a very well-loved landmark, on the El Camino in Sunnyvale. I want to thank Yvonne for, for being with us uh, tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Santa Clara County has been called the Blossom Valley often, and uh, recently I've heard of another term, a delightful one, the Valley of Heart's Delight. Yes. How did that ever come into use at Siobhan? In 1915, when San Francisco had recovered uh, from the, the 1906 earthquake, uh, they decided to have, throw a big party. It was called the Pan American Exposition of 1915. And our local newspapers in San Jose decided to run a competition to see what kind of um, title might come up that could be used to describe the county in a way that would be catchy. And the Valley of Heart's Delight uh, won the competition, and for good reason. The, the valley had uh, perfect temperature, it, had, um, it was a, a beautiful agricultural valley, and it afforded people a very uh, fine place to live. Well, it's a delightful name, and I just recently was able to view um, uh, a film, a documentary film that we're going to be rolling in some footage uh, of in this piece um, that was entitled The Valley of, of Heart's Delight. Um, but the valley was not always planted in orchard. Uh, we know from previous, a previous show on the Ohlone civilization that the indigenous people uh, lived off the land and from the bay, but they were really not farmers. Um, so I thought maybe it would be useful for the viewer if we could um, chronologue uh, the uses of the land um, over time so that we can properly set this agricultural period of, of fruit farming uh, where, it, where it belongs. So, after the uh, Spanish actually you know, made conquest of, of what we know now as California, more particularly Santa Clara Valley, um, how did their, um, this conquest uh, really change the use of the land? What, what, what was it that changed here? The, uh, as you said, the Indians didn't do agriculture, but the Spanish introduced uh, a type of agriculture referred to as mission agriculture, and it was an extensive type uh, called extensive because it used large areas of land, uh, in this case to raise cattle. Th they raised the cattle not for the beef, but for the hides and the tallow, which were sent by Spanish barks are boats that came into the bay uh, near Alviso uh, to pick up um, uh, these the hides and the tallow and taken all the way back to Spain to the king for the king's uh, uh, approval uh, or not his approval but his to be changed <laughs> to be changed into money to uh, to make him uh, his coffers richer and essentially this was a colony run on behalf of the king of Spain so um the, the Spanish then had really no um, 
accurate reporting about the land that they were using. It was just all of theirs, is that correct? That it was all, all theirs, uh, and the missions uh, defined uh, between each mission, halfway between each mission was the, the general boundary. Nobody worried about boundaries. There was so much land, and the, the, um, uh, they essentially placed the, the missions about one day's ride apart. Uh, to make it convenient, and also they didn't want to go to r have to ride in the in the nighttime because there were hostile Indians all around them, and and so they uh, placed them in a, in a kind of uh, uh, distance that would make it safe for them to travel. I see. So, how did the land change when when the the Mexican government took over? Well, the. Um, uh, Spanish uh, were here from uh, 18, uh, 1777 um, until 1822 when uh, Mexico threw off the yoke of Spain and claimed the lands of California as their own colony. And at that time, the uh, parceling out of the lands in Santa Clara County, and it's happened all through California at the same time, were uh, granted over or deeded over to people who had in some way served the, uh, the state of Mexico. And here in Los Altos Hills, there are uh, two grants that uh, date back to that era. And those are? The uh, La Parisima Concepcion, yeah. which is Los Altos Hills today, and uh, the um, uh, Rancho, Rancho San, San Antonio, Antonio I was say. which is uh, makes up part of Los Altos. Okay. So uh, these particular ranchos, they all had a different function, from what I understand. Is that correct? Well, they they each have an interesting history. The uh, Spanish measured their their land in leagues, which was about rounded to 4,400 acres per league. And in this case, each of those ranchos were uh, about one league. The uh, Rancho San Antonio had been awarded to um, a soldier who was well uh, respected. Uh, he was known for having uh, caught and beheaded, beheading the um, renegade Indian Yoscolo. And in fact, he took the head and planted it on a stake in, oh front, of <laughs> in front of the mission to deter any other Indians who might think of uh, challenging the authority of, uh, of the, the, uh, the army. And he was, he was granted the, the land, but he didn't have a chance, uh, much chance to enjoy it because he died shortly after. And then his family, uh, his, then his, his wife died, so there was a family of about eight or 10 children uh, orphaned. And they had uh, debts to pay, so the land was then almost immediately sold uh, at, and was bought by uh, two uh, Americans, the, the Dana brothers. They used the land to, ra to run cattle, and then in subsequently it was used to raise grains because um, if we keep our dates in, in view, in 1848 was the discovery of gold, yes. and then 300,000 people rushed into, Amer into California in the ensuing year. And the result was the, a need for, all of a sudden, a need for, for flour. So grain became one of the main uh, crops to be grown on the, uh, the lands in Los Altos and in Los Altos Hills. Now, uh, these ranchos were very, very large tracts of land, isn't right. that, is they that were, correct? They were small domains. Right. They were like little now, kingdoms. Now, were, were there any problems in, in managing those lands? Well, the problems arose. Uh, uh, an interesting example is the Los Altos Hills uh, Rancho. Th that history, uh, well, it was originally granted to two Indians who had served the uh, mission very well and uh, the Mexican government. And they then sold it for $300 to uh, Juana Briones. And $300, that works out to about 14 cents an acre. Wow. <laughs> We're not so, really hearing this, are we? <laughs> <laughs> then uh, Juana Briones, who was a very resourceful woman, um, also ran cattle on it. But she then leased it to uh, Martin Murphy, Jr., who uh, was a large landholder in Sunnyvale. Yes. And he uh, subsequently bought it from her. 
He then deeded it over to his uh, daughter, Elizabeth Yuba Tafe, and the, unfortunately, uh, her husband died, and then she died, and, well, I think it was the reverse, she died first, and the children were orphans. Now, in the next generation, they, um, there was another death in the, in the family, and also, at the same time, one of the brothers had uh, put a tremendous uh, uh, debt on the land, and so, eventually, all that prop property was sold in small parcels, uh, and the, the, the Tafe family still has a presence today in Los Altos Hills, fortunately. Oh, that's wonderful. So there is a connection with, mm -hmm. the, with this long line. But the moral of it was that for various reasons, sometimes out of their, their control, uh, property uh, had to be sold. And, um, or in some cases also, their lifestyle was such that they uh, didn't care to work. They expected income from the land, but didn't work the land, and the result was eventually it was sold because they had debts they couldn't pay. They just used it up, so to That's speak. That's correct. Right. Now, you have a, a couple of pictures that, that you brought yes. along? Uh, yes, this one uh, shows one of the early adobes on an adjacent, the camera this up. Uh, uh, adjacent rancho, uh, which is uh, on where Sears Roebuck is today, mm -hmm. and this is an interesting adobe. The, the uh, Secundindo Robles, who, who built the adobe, had 29 children, oh and, and they helped him run it as a cantina during the years, and it fell down in the 1906 earthquake. Uh, not all the, the farms uh, were um, given over to the raising of crops. Uh, some of them were uh, pleasure farms. In fact, this area uh, attracted uh, wealthy people who uh, wanted to um, have a summer residence here. Were they large uh, farms or well, ranches? Well, some, the, some of them were large. Uh, in this case, this was a very colorful, this was owned by a very colorful man, Louis O'Neill, who was one of the uh, political bosses of Santa Clara County. Oh, and that's what I understand. He ran, uh, he had 1,100 acres up on the top of Page Mill, and uh, in this photograph we can see um, a large group of people having gathered along Page Mill, and in the background there are vineyards, oh, yes. uh, which we'll talk about yeah. perhaps later. And uh, but they had come up there for a huge barbecue. I believe at one time he had 1,200 people there for a barbecue, and even 1,200 horse ra <laughs> <laughs> horse races on the, on the Page Mill Road. Oh, this is a wonderful photograph, which shows uh, Louis O'Neill there with the X's um, racing against his on his Palomino. Against it really looks like the Wild West. It was, in <laughs> fact, uh, uh, it was it was quite a colorful uh, place, and it had a very interesting history. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. So what you're saying is that uh, what we need to understand is that the tracts of land kept, you know, being pared down from the original rancho. Um, right. Ranchos and they're in, still, in being, the still being pared down today yeah. into smaller and smaller as, units. As we know. Right. Um, uh, from the, the large rancho to the wheat f or grain farm and then finally to the fruit farm. Um, when we think of California, uh, we often think of uh, in agriculture, we think of wine. Were there any wineries here? There were. Uh, the um, hills were dotted with vineyards. And as early as uh, 1876, John Snyder, who was a large landowner um, near the um, intersection of 280 and um, Foothill Expressway yes. in that area, he owned uh, between seven and 800 acres of land. He built uh, one of the first wineries in this area mm -hmm. in the 1870s, and uh, you can see the uh, horses lined up pulling, oh, yes, with the pulling barrels going the up. barrels of wine, taking them down to the Mountain View uh, Railroad Depot, where they would be taken to San Francisco to be used as a blend in with other wines. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a very big industry in Santa Clara County, and our area had its share of vineyards. Well, what happened? I mean, why did they give way to the, to the fruit farm? Well, in the 1890s, uh, the vineyards were struck by uh, a root louse, which is called Paloxera, and it destroyed the vineyards. And the uh, farmers then, uh, for a variety of reasons, turned to uh, fruit growing. Uh, one of the reasons was that the uh, it was discovered that a family of, say, three or four or five 
could subsist quite comfortably on a small acreage of land which was planted to fruit trees. So say it was 10 acres um, or uh, 20 acres. Mm -hmm. One family could take care of that amount of... Um, one, one family. Yes, then. one family would, would be able to care for that acreage without uh, hiring extra help. Mm -hmm. Um, and therefore, it made it economical for a family to uh, buy a 10-acre piece and to put in the money that was needed to start the orchard and then to, uh, over the years, uh, harvest the crops and, and continue uh, make a forward. living. Yes. Um, now, were the people originally here in California, were they coming in from other places? How did, they, how did it sort of catch on? The railroads had a great deal to do with promoting uh, the uh, virtues of land in California to the farmers. We've heard this before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Southern Pacific Railroad was uh, not only a landowner uh, itself, in Cal a large landowner in California, but of course it sold the tickets to bring the people to California, so they had a vested interest I in find promo that fascinating. <laughs> had, mm. to promoting people to come here, and they did put out a tremendous amount of brochures. In fact, they had their own uh, magazine, monthly magazine, um, called the Overland Monthly, and it was a. It really had some very fine writers who contributed to it, but in a sense, it was a promotional uh, piece for. Uh, for the Southern Pacific Railroad. And you brought one of those brochures along, did you not? Yes, I did. I brought one that was put out by the Board of Manufacturers in San Jose in the 1880s. And in it, uh, they describe what you might need to start up uh, a farm in Santa Clara County. Oh, this will be interesting. Yes. So, so the costs involved? And, yes, yes. You know. They had it worked out. Of course, what they don't mention here are the vicissitudes that you might <laughs> you might encounter if it rains uh, if it rains too much or if it rains too little or if you don't have enough frost or if you have too much frost and all the other things that can happen to a farmer. But, exactly. Uh, they left that to uh, for you to find out once you got here and it was too late. But essentially, they say that land in Santa Clara County in the 1880s could be had for 75 to 300 dollars per acre. Per and, acre. Yes. And that was that. That was quite a bit of money, though. Actually, in, in, yes, in it, it was quite yes. a, li a bit of money. And in fact, when they they give you ten acres of land, say at two hundred dollars, that's two thousand dollars for the for the property, and the cultivation costs at twenty dollars. Um, Seven hundred and fifty trees at twenty cents each, hundred and fifty dollars. The planting is sixty dollars, and the cultivation after the planting. The total came to $2,250 would be your entire outlay. But they also go on to pro, uh, predict that once you had this orchard running, uh, this property would be much more valuable. And if you wanted to sell it, then you would, you would realize a very good profit. So oh, the American dream, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, well, are, how many farms? Uh, do you estimate there were um, in Los Altos and Los, Los Altos Hills in the early part of the century? Well, the best I can, uh, how I, the best way for me to answer that is to say that the greatest number of farms in this county uh, were uh, in the 1920s when the plantings had reached uh, a height. I think there were 125,000 acres in cultivation in the 1920s. Just in this area? Just in, San, in Santa Clara County. In Santa Clara County. And my okay. best guess is that in our corner of the county, okay. Los Altos and Los Altos Hills, that we probably had no more than 300 to 350 farms. Uh, maybe one could say uh, less than 500 and be safe. Be safe. But um, we had, what we did have here was ex the exceptional apricots. The, uh, this uh, was considered to be the area for growing the finest tasting apricots in the whole valley. Why and is that, do you think? Well, it was a combination of the soil and the amount of sunshine sure. and the, the amount of rain and the frost in the winter time. I mean, all of these things combined uh, to produce uh, particularly delicious and beautiful golden Blenheim apricot. apricots. Yes. 
So um, are there any uh, remnants of any of those Los Altos or Los Altos Hills farms still uh, here today, Yvonne? There are a few. Um, ar around, um, in Los Altos, around the History House, the Smith House. Of course, sure. And the, and the library um, and the, the whole Civic Center. The whole there. Civic Center is, is today farmed by Don Speciali, who is, uh, works with the city to uh, take care of the farms there. Um, in uh, Los Altos Hills, there is the Packard family who has uh, put 25 acres, I believe, of hillside apricots into a trust so that it can be kept in perpetuity uh, as a producing orchard. Mm -hmm. Then there is um, a, a little winery that is working on Page Mill Road called Page Mill Winery. And Mr. Stark um, puts out about uh, 2,000 cases of uh, wine a year. And I just spoke to him this evening, and he said that he has three neighbors adjacent to him who are each now raising between one half and an acre of grapes. He buys from two of them, and the third individual sells to yet another winery. So oh, we nice. have a little mini winery operation going oh, on there. That's interesting. Now, in, in terms of the apricots, they were very perishable. They are a very perishable fruit. They are. How did, how did uh, the farmer get them to market? Um, well, there were uh, two or three ways a farmer could market. One was to cut the apricots on his own farm and put them on trays and then into a sulfur house where they are cured and sell them and dry them in the sun and then sell them as dried uh, apricots to one of the buyers who would come around uh, from uh, various sources who interested in buying dried fruit, dried apricots. The other thing was uh, many, of the far many, many of the small farmers belonged to co-ops. To co Santa Clara County was a hotbed of farmer co-ops and out of our valley uh, came one of the most successful co-ops, and that's Sunsweet. It was the, uh, the Prune and Apricot Growers oh, Association. Yes. 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 And today it is still in existence as one of the most uh, successful stories relating to the co-op. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Well, this time has gone so quickly, Yvonne. Uh, thank you so much for um, joining us this evening. Um, uh, about this very uh, wonderful era in the uh, Los Altos history because uh, so many of the residents have such a keen interest in this, in this particular um, uh, facet of our history. And I thank you again for, for enlightening us about uh, what it is that takes it, it to be a farmer here in this valley, um, or, or was. Um, we were able to pull together a collection of old photographs and uh, video footage from the documentary that I mentioned called The Valley of Heart's Delight, which was originally produced in 1922, as well as some current video to show you where to find the reminders of this time past that Yvonne and I have just discussed. We hope you've enjoyed this evening's show, and please join us next time for the Los Altos History Show. Goodbye for now, and let's roll that tape now. on this day in this place would have argued for an instant with Roscoe Wyatt when he said, in this valley of heart's delight, you will find life pleasurable, toil honorable, and recreation plentiful. Orchards demand dedication and hard work year round. Lyle Hustis, who grew up on an apricot orchard on the border of Los Altos and Mountain View, recalls in her diary. My parents worked hard to produce healthy trees that in turn would yield a hundredfold. Each season exacted its fair share. In the fall and winter months, trees were pruned to make way for the new growth. Machinery, tools, lugs, and trays were repaired. Wells were drilled. In the spring, the orchards were cultivated and sprayed for pests and blight. After the trees blossomed in late February or early March, the fear of frost always hovered. 
Smudge pots were often used to raise the temperature in the orchard in the very early hours of the morning in order to protect the fragile crop. Each tree received a personal going over. The fruit clusters on the trees were thin because a larger or fancier fruit brought a better price. Near the end of June, the fruit would be ready to be picked, dried, or sold. The canneries would pick up filled picking boxes or lugs and deliver empties daily. This was an all-out effort with everyone pitching in to help, both young and old alike. Often friends, neighbors, and families rallied to the cause. Dried fruit was a large part of the apricot harvest. Apricots were sulfured to retain color and disinfect. Then the apricots were dried on large trays in the sun before being packed for market. The kernels or pits of the apricots were packed in sacks and sold abroad to Germany to be used in the production of laetrile. Farmers in Santa Clara County formed co-ops where their fruit harvests would be packed and shipped all over the world. These colorful labels identify the fruit and packers in Santa Clara County and are now collector's items. The packing was done primarily by women. There were 20 pounds to the box, 50 boxes to the half ton. A good fruit picker could earn between two to three dollars per 10 hour day. Nearby canneries employed women as well on a seasonal basis. The women returned year after year to augment the family's yearly income. The 10 hour shift based on piecework averaged about two dollars a day. The most nostalgic of memories revolve around the blossom. There are still reminders of that long past time in tiny pockets dotting the Los Altos and Los Altos Hills landscape. Apricot trees are a focal point around the Civic Center of Los Altos. The Gilbert Smith Farmhouse on the Civic Center property is now the History House Museum. The 10-acre Smith Farm was donated by the Smiths to the city of Los Altos at the time of the city's incorporation. There are small pockets of rural Los Altos sprinkled around the city. You must search them out and use your imagination, however. For example, this property is on Los Altos Avenue, now a main crosstown thoroughfare in Los Altos. This property on the corner of Pine Lane and Los Altos Avenue has a tank house where once water was stored for irrigation. Today, there are still some acres dedicated to fruit farming in Los Altos Hills. This Federal Express truck rushing by in this charming scene in Los Altos Hills probably sums up best the incongruity of living in this area. But if you take the time to uncover these pockets, you can recapture, if only for a moment, the remnants of the Valley of Heart's Delight.